This one I, I had to go. So, um, yeah, what's the talk about? It's about um, how we in this uh, crazy company, Brits Peterman, use Hex in a creative environment. And um, we, that is Andre, myself, and uh, Timo, so three guys, and uh, we've worked um, together as a team for uh, six years or eight years about. Uh, in, a, in an agency, in a normal uh, multimedia agency, doing a lot of flash, of course, presentations, also a little bit mobile stuff. And then two years ago, uh, all three of us decided, OK, that's enough. <laughs> Let's do something different and explore what, what else we can do with our interactive skills and not being afraid uh, to approach any new media, but uh, really come from the idea of the um, of the experience that w what you want to do and then just pick the technology you want to do and not the other way around please do something with flash and then um, you start working so this is uh, somehow our slogan childlike curiosity that's exactly this don't being not having any fear just approaching things and meet sophisticated multimedia and this means here, so on the one hand, uh, solid project management, strictly typing languages, and uh, nice architecture, and solid, solid crafting. And yeah, so that was when I came in touch with Hex the first time. It was a perfect coding environment. It is in uh, San Francisco National Park in the north. And uh, I spent some time there alone and got in touch with this uh, really uh, living idea of Flash is dead in San Francisco. It, I have no strong feelings about this, but being in San Francisco, they, it, it's really vivid. <laughs> so so it um, was, was a strange experience. And then I thought, OK, I go into it and just reevaluate all kind of front end technologies I've worked <laughs> with so far. And uh, I was working with um, that at that time with uh, Cinder and processing Flash, JavaScript, and then um, I got into this Hex topic and um, was working with Hex and Canvas. And then uh, I thought, okay, why not this funny WebGL? And then I combined Hex and WebGL, programmed in the Chrome, uh, in, the, in the Chrome browser, and that was stunning. That was great. That was how I ever wanted to develop uh, multimedia stuff. And um, those were the three experiments I came back from my holiday. So the first one is this um, kind of, it's all not, it's nice. Or <laughs> <laughs> so look at this. So it's uh, <coughs> not made for this uh, screen resolution. So it's some kind of particle systems. I always love particle systems. It's my kind of hello world for a different uh, <laughs> language. And. Um, I also want to add some fluid stuff, so that was nice. I had fun with it. And then I also did this um, like uh, demo scene uh, uh, Amiga 500 wobble effect. When I coded this the first time when I was, I don't know, very young, then I did it pixel-based and always wondered why the people are getting that so fast. And now I know you have to use a shader. <laughs> and then it uh, works pretty good. And of course, one really great um, testing thing for experience new, experiencing new platforms is this um, nice thing. It's just uh, 20 lines of code, and then you got this very nice uh, geometric function. And um, it was also very popular um, in the flash uh, area with this uh, pushing particles. So how many particles can you display? And yeah, I wanted to know how many particles can I display with Hex and WebGL. And then I found out, oh, OK, it's not just the amount. I can shade it, I can give it color, and I can even move it. And that was, that was new. I, I like this. 
idea. Okay, and then um, I arrived back in Germany with the three examples and we thought, okay, let's do something with it. And particles were too boring, we did a lot of that stuff. That stuff was too old school, let's say. And then we said, okay, we want to do something with this uh, strange attractor. And we focused on um, mainly on doing a nice web experience from it. And a web, web experience, especially uh, the JavaScript guys, there are a lot of nice demos. There are, there are a lot of really crazy technology demos using 3, 3D and all the, the um, uh, frameworks. But they forget about simple things like having a preloader, having an entrance for the experience, making it all round and nice and stuff like this. And so that, that was the goal. Came back with this technology demo and then one week making it round, making it a nice experience. And al also, but that was difficult, coming from that technology, what's actually the topic of the, of the demo? What, what will be the topic? And um, yeah, and we decided somehow let's let's work with light instead of form. So that is the topic. So we shaded the thing and we want to give it some background and some some environment and yeah, that was the first um, approach. Just an image and um, with not so much focus in the form but more to the, to the shading, to the light. And then we placed the attractor in it and gave it a preloader, a start to the entrance, added some music, and then uh, the nice thing at the end was um, um, using the level of the music in order to make it move. And that was the end, and then we thought, okay, that worked somehow, doing something with WebGL and Hex. Uh, I'm going to show you the demo. Um, if you like computer graphics, then have a look at the shading of the Strange Attractor. If you like music, then see how dance. If you're fond of design, then have a look how we uh, implemented the, um, the lightning situation somehow. And I'm going to click around a little bit, but not going to talk. So that's the preloader. <laughs> Want to see it again? Awesome, isn't it? <laughs> but it's important that you have this thing. That's the entrance. little sphere there is actually a shadow and the lines that were there were somehow distorted and uh, when I first shaded that thing here um, I tried to make it as real as possible and it just looked crappy and then Andre our designer said Nico why do you always have to make everything real and make it do, do something crazy and then I um, yeah totally changed the, the shading in a way that's actually not realistic and also left the, those distortions as they are, and I like it, so it doesn't have to be realistic every time. Okay, that's the, uh, so, uh, what is it? It's, it's just uh, Hex and WebGL, no other technology used. Okay, and then, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and then we, we put it on the, on the blog and posted it. And um, even yesterday, uh, I asked you what's Google opinion about Hex. And the reason for that is there, there is this website, um, uh, web, WebGL from Google. And I posted that demo twice there. And they, they do not put it on the website. I don't know why. <laughs> so it cannot be that bad. OK, yeah. And yeah, we put it on the blog and then I was in holiday, and also Timo was on holiday, and then we received some kind of email, 
uh, that we actually, with this demo, won the first prize of the Mozilla demo competition. <laughs> that, was, that was a surprise. And it was cool because it's just one week of work and we had a lot of fun and uh, no customer somehow there. And then we won um, a trip to Helsinki, all uh, three of us, and we spent uh, three amazing days there at, at this um, uh, conference called Alternative Party. It's a typical demo party. We met a lot of crazy people there. They are still coding on the C. Uh, VC64 and VC20 and doing amazing stuff with it, for example, connecting the Kinect with such a device or doing, putting a laser on a Kalashnikov and shooting things, so it was really an amazing party. Yeah, that was cool. Um, but usually we try to um, give things a different approach. Though. So this was from an existing technology to an idea, to an experience. And um, this is t what we know from our agency work. So, oh great, we have our air now. Let's do something with our air. And um, what can we do? What can we offer our customers? And what we, what we desperately try for years now is reverse this project. So first think about what's, what's the experience? What, what's the medium? What do, you, what do you want to communicate? What's the experience you want to give to the user? And then, in the second step, think about what kind of technology are you, you using for that. And you can imagine that Hex is actually very cool in such an environment because you can choose afterwards and you can try different technologies by just implementing it once. Mm. And um, so what we do is we have a plan. How much money do you want to earn for a year? And then after we have the money, we stop working for customers and have some kind of passion project. And um, what I'm going to show you next is the passion project of the last year. And um, it's, a, it's a shop window installation. So this is our office over there. It's in Bonn. And uh, it's actually not a usually business office. There was a nail studio before in it. And there before it was a haircut. <laughs> and now there's, there's us uh, in this um, little shop. And um, yeah, we, we like having a website. We, we, we thought about what, what, what are we going to do with this uh, shopping window. So what's, what's our approach to, to work with this uh, shopping window? What's, what's the idea? And yeah, and then um, we thought about, yeah, why, why not? I think it's quite obvious, but we want to have it interactive, somehow digital. And uh, the first idea was, uh, okay, we make the window look back. So usually you, you look into the shopping window and we just, again, reverse that project and say, okay, the window looks back to the, to the, the passing, to the people who pass by. And so we, we created those uh, funny eyes. And um, yeah, it's just a semi-transparent foil put on the window, and then a projector in the back end. Here's running a Chrome with WebGL implemented on Hex, some kind of um, eyes that are implemented as a shader. There's some kind of uh, sphere shader that with, with it you can make easily spheres. And um, there's a Kinect standing over there, and some uh, open frameworks uh, detection stuff. And yeah, it was good at the first place, so it was amazing how easily it was implemented and it worked right away. The only thing was um, the communication between the server and uh, the front end wasn't good enough because we were just pulling the data from the hard disk where are the people standing. And then, uh, so the only optimization we really had to do was the, um, was implementing a um, WebSocket implementation. And uh, yeah, that, that we had also had fun on with this. So uh, we wanted to have the installation running from afternoon to night. And for the installation, it was fine if it runs the whole time, but the beamer, uh, the projector had to be shut down. And there's some kind of media interface on the projector, but it's far away and we couldn't plug with cable in. So we wrote, uh, created this little installation. There's a servo behind there. And he's actually, it's actually pushing the button of the remote <laughs> control. <laughs> 
and that thing, uh, yeah, was okay. So and uh, yeah, because of this is not exper you cannot experience this on a website. So we took some effort to make a nice video documentation about it, and I'm going to show you this uh, two-minute video. And it's, for a software developer, it's so great to think about this is all running in a browser. <laughs> that is actually a web experience. <laughs> this is uh, the Open Frameworks uh, backend. Here are the blobs. And then we have the size of the blob, the position, and um, position x, y, z. OK. The video is a bit longer, but uh, I'll skip it that we can save some time. OK, so that was uh, the first out of three shopping window installations. The next is. Um, was the idea to um, yeah, somehow, again, reversing something. So it's reversing the, uh, reversing the idea of uh, usually you hear music and then you dance. And this reverses it. You dance, and that creates the music. And um, so the idea is to have this uh, three uh, shapes here, which is um, acrylic glass or something also with some uh, um, semi-transparent foil. And then you have those um, lines here, and they, they move like this if you pass by. And then the idea was um, that uh, if you have the storefront here and you move along, then you're playing a piano whenever you hit a new area. So something like dum 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 and uh, yeah, the first version was really awful, was horrible, the sound was terrible, and has no, had no feeling at all, so it was really bad. So we were um, doing two optimizations. The one, th one thing was um, only using notes from a certain harmonic, so I think it was C dur or E dur, uh, I don't know. And the other one, which was much more important, was uh, measuring the velocity of the people, and then uh, using that velocity as how hard you hit the key on the piano. And it was uh, implemented by using MIDI and GarageBand <laughs> and the backend. So what you then could really do is, um, so we had a three to two meters, some, something like this, and the high tones here and the low notes here, and here's something in between. And so you could move around, and so then you do doom Loom, loom, boom, boom. <laughs> because you are moving faster, it was louder. And uh, that, that, that was what, what the installation at the end made, made really good. But if you compare this to the eyes, with the eyes we had uh, mothers who, who worked a longer way to pass our window with their two-year-old children. And they understood it. They got it. They, they worked uh, on by and said, oh, eyes, eyes. And they were happy somehow. So we really could affect um, on a very basic level. I call this subtile. I don't know if this is a correct word for it, but very easy to understand. That was much harder to understand for the people. OK.
That sound is real. Okay, third and last installation. Uh, we wanted to, to do something with words and um, to see how, how people... So the, the first installation, the eyes were very easy to catch. The second one was a little bit, bit harder. And um, now it was about doing some poetry. So how many people do you reach with poetry? We didn't know. We wanted to try. And uh, we created those uh, five window frames. And then by touching them, you can uh, change the word that is in there. And it's always some kind of sentence, uh, sentence like French, ast astronauts, sometimes dance gently, something like this. And you add a list of words, and you can touch it and change it. And um, yeah, we were very interested how it, how it works. And here with this installation, we had to do three optimizations. The one thing is, if you imagine you have the the shopping window here and then here in frame and you put the Kinect there then you just have the frame itself as a shadow in front of the hands so you have to put the Kinect very close to the window and th then you use um, you're losing angle so you just have one meter to detect and what we did is then use two Kinects putting them like this and then uh, w which is I, I love it from a math perspective then using, uh, taking that room and making it one room and then make the detection within that room. That was very nice. And um, the other thing was, it really didn't work. <laughs> so people, people were working by and they just didn't, didn't recognize anything. There are so many people who are just not looking, so they, or especially if they're phoning and they walk on by and they don't get it, that there's something interactive there. So we did two changes. Uh, the one thing is we actually spelled the sentence by computer voice. So if you enter the window, then the sentence is actually spelled. And the other thing is we implemented a very silly call to action, some kind of touch me <laughs> window. And uh, yeah, it was a, we made a little fun with it. We put a Samantha Fox behind it. You may know the song, touch me, touch me now. And uh, yeah, but still worked somehow.
Yeah, if you ever want to do a button with a Kinect, don't make it solid. So your hand is always in the shadow, so you only have to make a ring that you can uh, detect through. So something we learned afterwards. Okay, yeah, we had some, again, like the um, Helsinki thing, we had some nice feedback. The first thing was we presented the eyes um, at a um, culture VJ festival, and they were placed at the entrance. And so everybody was walking on by, and we had the same effects. So really, people are, they don't have to get it. You stand in front of it, you somehow feel scary, you start moving around, and they look at you. So that worked, worked again great. Then um, in the area of Kinect, um, some photo of the eyes again were used in a magazine. So again, the eyes, three installations, everybody's just talking about the eyes. And we, uh, someone at the Rockefeller Center wanted to actually buy an installation from us. And it was an optic eye doctor. And guess what you wanted to <laughs> buy from us? Uh, we're still working uh, on this, but it's, uh, it's, really, it's really not that, that easy. So there's uh, some Flickr and Vimeo stuff if here if you want to have a look at it. And by the way, the presentation is uh, here. And the presentation is written in hex, by the way. <laughs> uh, it also works in uh, Safari and a little bit on Firefox. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just not optimized for the web. OK. Um, yeah, some uh, resume. Uh, projections are hard to sell. <laughs> so that's for sure. It's just too difficult. You can do this. Our, the next uh, experiments we are going to do will have some kind of power adapter, and you plug it in the wall, and then you can experience it. So that's the next step. So no, no window stuff anymore. It was nice, but it's, um, you cannot make money with it. Then um, Really nice and very obvious, uh, the more subtile an experience is, the more, more easy it is to understand. So when I came back from San Francisco the last time, I was uh, using some kind of um, internet server connection IP list data, and I wanted to make it a nice graph. And um, actually it worked out pretty well, but then we thought about, OK, what, what are we doing with it? How do we present it? So the beautiness of the internet itself, the beautiness of numbers, something like this. But you cannot expect so many people to just follow that idea. So yeah, simple is good. Another thing is uh, very interesting, maybe something special about our company. The time management is possible. And so it's definitely possible to say, OK, we want to have our spare time for our passion project. That, that's possible. But everybody in the company has to be behind this and has to say, OK, passion and creativity and personal uh, evolvement is more important than money. And that's actually not that easy, but it works. And I think it's a good, uh, good, good thing to achieve. Then on the other hand, having all this on our website is actually very, very confusing communication. If you usually work for agencies and do internet websites and mobile applications and stuff like this, and then you come with that thing so people don't get it. What, what's, it's, it's hard enough to understand what we actually all do. But uh, if you confuse it like that, then it's even worse. Yeah, and another thing is, uh, since this time in San Francisco, when I started working with Hex, I, I have done all the projects with it because it's so easy to change the technologies. And uh, that's, that's really, really something great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah. yeah, and maybe I can give something back. Um, so I'm not, not so really into the community stuff because it's just uh, uh, takes so much time. And I, I would love to, but, um, but nevertheless, um, I was, when I, when I, in Flash, I was mostly doing all my stuff with uh, Parsley. It's an application framework from Jens Heim. And uh, it's the idea of having an injector wrapped around by a context builder. Who, and then you just throw in some classes, and everything is wired. And you have a front controller sending communications, and everything configured by metadata. So that's the way I like to work. And um, every project that you have seen here, which I've shown, 
they were all developed by some kind of port of this parsley to hex. And I started doing this right away. So that was before I implemented Akimi, I, was, I, I thought to myself, no, I'm not working without an injector anymore. And um, yeah, I ported it. And um, some projects were, were created um, uh, with this uh, framework. And recently, Patrick Culling from uh, Germany came and said, ah, oh, Nico, it's so great that you have all the stuff on GitHub, and, but can we please put this framework out of your projects to a separate repository that the people can uh, access it and work with it, and give it a name, for example. And we did this, and uh, we named this uh, application framework Persil, which is, uh, you probably all know French for what's in English, Parsley. And I thought this is actually a very good name, porting this to a French language. And um, yeah, it's on GitHub. Um, it has a, uh, the same structure as uh, Parsley has, and it works exactly in the same way. And also, the repositories are structured in in the same way. However, it's really just 5%. It's just the idea, so it's very small. We didn't really port every single little feature. And it's uh, just we never have tested it outside the JavaScript environment. So that's, of course, something you should know if you work with it. And yeah, I want to um, show you a little bit. If I can kind of push the button. <coughs> And uh, what, what you see here is um, the, some kind of uh, framework or uh, environment where all these um, uh, demos have been created. And uh, let's say it's the matrix. And uh, so we got a fr uh, the frame rate here and uh, some kind of screens. So, it's, so there's also some kind of navigator where you can make transitions through different screens. And every screen is, um, uh, has some kind of layers. And then if you make a transition from one screen to, the no to another screen, those layers are mixed in and rendered in a particular order. And that's actually very important if you work on a GL environment. So usually in Flash, I would use a different way of make making navigation. But for WebGL, it's really just the idea in what order do you render your stuff. And um, yeah, this is a gray screen here. And then it's, it has a clear layer and a color layer and some kind of display list layer. And the display list layer is actually are the buttons around. So um, it's an idea of the flash display list that was ported to WebGL. And then uh, you can make changes in the actual environment. So if you make some kind of creative experiments, you can right away change the stuff and see how it uh, works. And for example, this color layer here then has an attribute or a field variable color. And then you just annotate it with add param. And then it's listed automatically here. So it's very easy to um, create applications and stuff like this. So here, this is. Now a transition, so the background is going away instead of some shapes show up here, and the next screen has some kind of different shapes. So that's what this navigational thing is doing. That also works in WebGL for very <coughs> hard to compute stuff. And very nice, uh, I also ported some uh, demo scene shaders to this environment nice to, to look at that big. <laughs> and that's what I like with uh, WebGL. You just have some textures in the memory. And this kind of renderer is just using texture number zero. And texture number zero is the, uh, the frame rate. And so the texture here everywhere is the frame rate. <laughs> and nice. So that's all uh, stuff that's coming from Rodriguez's uh, demo scene code, although that's not, not my stuff. But I found it interesting, compared actually to Flash, how easy it is to port all that stuff to JavaScript compared to this crazy Flash uh, language, this, this shader stuff they created. Yeah, we also have done some kind of projection mapping with that stuff. 
And here is the, um, uh, the internet uh, graph that I talked about. And I, I just reload it and show it in the beginning. So those are all the nodes. It's uh, 64,000 nodes. And now it's using a force-based model in order to um, distribute the nodes evenly somehow. The really cool thing here is that when every, every time you see it move, one step of the physical computation is finished. So if you imagine this without being computed in the background, you wouldn't have an experience at all because it's just standing. And the nice thing is that's computed in a web worker, which is also written in hex. And then um, when the web worker has finished after two or three seconds, He's uh, transmitting the data to the front end here. And in between, all the points that have been before and now are interpolated. And so I have a really smooth experience here. And I can even change values uh, in, in real time, while in the background, one CPU is 100% computing the stuff. So that is something where I think I, ca I cannot do this in Flash. So that is amazing to have something like a thread in the background doing really heavy computations and still having 60 frames per second in a fluid experience. So, and, and this is, I, I like if things are fast. Okay, also here are the, is the piano and here is the eye. And it's, uh, it now uses the, uh, the mouse as an, uh, as an input. And it's uh, made for full HD, so. That's why it's not here. OK, so if you like to work in what, yeah, I love to, sh to share this. I love to, um, to work uh, with you on that if, if, you, if you want to. Um, yeah, maybe you find this interesting. And it's easy to dig in. So it's all on GitHub. Just uh, check it out. And then I'm going, uh, when do we, how much time do we have? It's over? OK. Um, yeah, that, that's, no, that's, that's have, have a look. If you're a coder, you will find this easy to dig into it. And um, yeah. So this is the link to our website. That is um, the GitHub repository with Akemi and this uh, application framework for WebGL where you can work very creatively and just put stuff together. And this is uh, the URL for this very presentation where you then have all the URLs in for all the other stuff. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, which language are you using for what you? Um, I'm using GLES. And it's actually nice that you ask, <laughs> because um, I love to, to do it differently. Um, for example, um, I just try to find uh, something. So this is one of the, the layers. And you see here, um, this is actually the layer for the eyes, which is creating the mask. You have the injects for different modules, uh, have the, the parameters. And this is a layer, which is one of those layers. And then every time I have a shader, I put the shader in the bottom of the layer. And it then looks like this. And what I did is uh, create um, an annotation and put the source code of the shader within the annotation, and then have some kind of uh, initialization here, where I say create program from vertex, and vertex then is this class here. So uh, of course, it would be really nice not to have strings, but really proper keywords. And Awesome. 
Ah, it's okay. okay, cool, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was a long way. I had 10 ways of implement implementing the shader, and at the end, uh, I thought this is the easiest. Yeah, yeah but it would be, would be really cool to work not on a string. Yes. So, sorry, I didn't catch it. I did the bindings of WebGL, and I wondered if they work. Because I'm, I'm not WebGL guy, so I wrote the bindings, but don't know if they work. What kind of bindings? Uh, I wrote um, I do uh, library of extend for, that, uh, for HTML5, and I wrote the WebGL bindings, which is written in WebGL. Ah, OK. And yeah. I wasn't sure if anyone could test it. Yeah, it yeah. It yeah, it would, it would actually be great if they were some kind of central. So I got the feeling that every framework uses its own externals for that stuff. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, I've created my own. <laughs> and I, I, I copied it from somewhere and then changed it in the way I want to have it. <laughs> Probably as everybody did. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Where, where is it? Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. <laughs>